How much would you estimate that you and I actually owe to future generations? Do you think it's possible that we're morally responsible for building the world of tomorrow, the one our descendants are going to have to live in? And just how capable would we be of doing that, especially when we can't seem to fix our own problems? Just the other day, I was flying home from a speaking appointment and I pulled out this book by William McCaskill, a contemporary Scottish philosopher. And I've got to admit, he really gave me some stuff to think about. Now, the name of the book is What We Owe the Future, and as you can probably guess, he's making the case that you and I have a moral obligation to future generations, an obligation to leave the world better than we found it. It's not just the nice thing to do, he says, it's the right thing a moral responsibility. And of course, at first blush, nobody's going to argue with that. Most parents already instinctively try to give their kids better opportunities. They make sure they get a decent education and grow up to be confident and independent adults. Throughout the history of parenthood, parents have, generally speaking, put their own desires and their own well-being on the back burner. If they think, it means their children will prosper. I mean, over the years, how many times haven't you been inspired by the story of a single mother who worked two or three jobs and did without sleep and skipped meals so that her children would have the chance to rise above poverty? But that's not really what this book is driving at, at least not in the opening chapters. The author is driving at much bigger things, cleaning up the environment, changing the moral landscape, and establishing a more just society. And again, Who's really going to argue with that? Except that I can't help but notice that historically speaking, our very best efforts to deliberately engineer a better future have almost always ended in moral disaster. Which makes me really suspicious about people who claim they have a blueprint to a better, almost utopian tomorrow. I mean, let's just think about our recent history. The most carefully engineered societies that emerged in the 20th century are now remembered as some of the most brutal. And of course, Mr. McCaskill isn't naive and he isn't promising utopia. I'm just telling you that I have some grave reservations about our ability to engineer a so-called more just society for ourselves, let alone people who live way down in the future. Because what often happens when we do that is that people become less important than policies and we usually find ourselves willing to get rid of people who stand in the way of ideological objectives. I mean, the death toll for the communist experiment of the 20th century exceeded 100 million people, and it produced several butchers like Joseph Stalin, who didn't mind starving millions of his own subjects if it meant accumulating more power. And I find it fascinating that the Bible talks about a fatal flaw in our human character, a flaw that we find ourselves incapable of fixing. It says we're inherently selfish, which is hard to argue with because, generally speaking, it seems like when many of the people who cry for more justice actually achieve a modicum of political power, they somehow change and become part of the problem. And so I find myself kind of torn when I see a book like McCaskill's because, well, of course we have a moral obligation to our fellow human beings. And of course, if the kingdom of God doesn't come first, we want to leave the planet better than we found it. So generally speaking, obviously I'm in agreement. But at the same time, I'm offering a giant word of caution because how many times over the course of recorded history have we ever actually fixed something? For example, I've brought this up before, but countless generations have boldly proclaimed the end of human war, most famously toward the end of the 19th century and into the 20th. But then by 1914, we had our first world war, followed very quickly by the second one. And we witnessed a level of carnage the world had never seen before. In fact, if I'm remembering this correctly, more than 200 million people died across all the wars of the 20th century. 
And of course, one of the key problems we had in the middle of the 20th century was the fact that Hitler's idea of a better tomorrow clashed with the rest of the world's. And so did Stalin's. So, if we're going to start planning for a better tomorrow, I mean, really make an effort to engineer a better world, who gets to cast that vision? Who gets to be in charge of it? The hard reality of living on this planet is that we have a huge proportion of the human population who simply don't agree on what that utopia should look like. Of course, again, uh, I'm now going places that the author doesn't actually go, and so I don't want you to think he's pushing for a completely re-engineered society. I mean, honestly, I haven't even finished reading the book yet. And maybe he does do that, I don't know. But based on what I've read so far, I kind of doubt it. I'm just considering what historically happens when we begin to think we can somehow just apply human logic and reason our way out of our very worst character traits. But of course, that doesn't mean I'm saying we shouldn't try. Of course we should try. I just think that treating society as if it's some kind of scientific lab experiment is dangerous because it has never succeeded, not even once. Why? It's because there are too many variables, too much potential for unintended consequences. And of course, there's also the nagging problem of our essentially selfish nature. I mean, let's think about this. When most people have to make a choice between what's good for everybody else and what's good for them, well, what does our natural instinct drive us to do? I think you know the answer, because the people who instinctively do what's good for somebody else are so rare, they actually surprise us. We make heroes out of these people. We name streets after them. We raise statues to their honor. That's how rare, genuinely altruistic people really are. So for, for just a few minutes, let's consider the moral implications of trying to frame a world that somebody else is going to have to live in. Of course, to some extent, we do that already every day. All of the big decisions we make on this planet are likely going to change the way that future generations are going to have to live. That much is obvious. And I think because we're building the future anyway, we should be thinking about negative consequences to the best of our ability, and we should do what we can to avoid those. And of course, as we do that, we're going to get a lot of things wrong because there's no way we can accurately anticipate the world of the future. Any more than a group of Greek philosophers living 600 years before Christ could ever anticipate this world, where, for example, I can talk to people face to face in real time anywhere on the planet anytime I want. Under those circumstances, I wouldn't necessarily want to live by the rules set way back then. But just because we can't really imagine the future, does that mean we shouldn't try to improve it? Again, of course not. But it's that whole problem with our imperfect fallen natures that makes me suspicious of people who claim to have all the answers, because, well, that's never been the case. Yet still there's something in our hearts that makes us want to follow people who promise to make utopia happen. And almost every single time we get sharply disappointed. I mean, if you want to see it on a smaller scale, watch the election cycle every time it rolls out here in the United States of America. During the primary season, all kinds of promises are made and somebody's poll numbers rise as voters choose to believe them and they start to lean in that candidate's direction. In spite of our past experience, people continue to get their hopes up. And then when the candidates we believed in are actually elected, about two years into their term, we usually, not always, but we usually send their party a disciplinary message in the midterms. The poll numbers start to drop because yet again, another political candidate didn't fix our worst problems. Now expand that idea across the entire planet and ask yourself, who exactly is going to be in charge of building utopia? You want me to do it? Because I don't want you to do it. And I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. 
Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Okay, we're back. So let me raise some ethical questions that popped into my mind when I started to think about what kind of moral obligation we might have to the future. The author of this book basically takes the position that humanity as we recognize it now emerged from the evolutionary process about 300,000 years ago. Then he suggests that the average lifespan for a species of mammals is about a million years, at which point, he says, we turn into something else or we just go extinct. Now, that's not the way that I look at things because it's not the biblical point of view. But what he does with that idea is propose that most of the human beings who will ever live still don't exist. Our biggest population, he says, by a long shot, will live in the very distant future. And so because of that, we have a moral obligation to those people because, well, he thinks they're going to outnumber us. But where exactly does he get that idea? Why does he assume that greater numbers of people are worth more than fewer numbers of people? Why would he assign moral worth to the size of a population? I mean, I get it. When you live in a Western democracy, you're raised in the idea that the majority must rule, and so more people will always seem like they carry more value than less people. But why? And how are we supposed to know that? Now again, I don't believe this. But suppose that we really did emerge as a unique species 300,000 years ago, just for the sake of argument. How exactly did that happen? Was it an accident? Did incredibly vast amounts of time coupled with chance somehow accidentally produce the human race? Self-conscious, self-aware, rational people? And if we really got here by accident, why is there any moral worth to preserving anything? I mean, it's just an accident, right? And at some point, it's all going to disappear. And then 100 million years after that, the theory says, nobody's ever going to know that we even existed. So who's to say that our presence in this galaxy has any moral worth? And why should we assume that the needs of some future majority are more important than my needs? Where does that idea come from? I mean, you and I are going to be dead when that distant future arrives. So why in the world should we care about it? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm not arguing that future people don't matter, I'm just asking why. Where exactly do these moral values, these moral price tags actually come from? Somebody might argue that it's a matter of self-preservation for the human race, that we need to keep humanity going, and that makes it a moral issue. But why? I mean, we all understand that we're going to die anyway, and after the passage of this much human history, we should understand that suffering is probably going to be a part of every generation anyway. So who's to say that the future happiness of people we will never meet is more important than ours? Why should I sacrifice for people who don't even exist yet? And again, just in case somebody's tuning in right now, let me emphasize, this isn't the way I actually think. I come to the world from a Christian perspective, which absolutely requires that we esteem other people as more important than ourselves. After all, notice what it says in Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Biblical Christians believe in selflessness because that's the example of Christ who sacrificed everything for our future happiness. And the very reason that I'm free to own a copy of the Bible at all is because so many Christians living in the past were willing to make absolutely massive sacrifices to make sure of it. What we have from the biblical perspective is the belief that there is such a thing as an authentic human life, a right way to live, with authentic human values provided by the Creator. We may not do it perfectly, in fact we seldom do, but when it comes to considering others, including people who might live way off in the future, there's a solid reason for doing this. We're living in harmony with a pattern that God established. And by no means do I believe that you have to be a Christian to be a decent or moral person. And I say that because I've heard a lot of Christians suggest that atheists do not have the capacity to be moral, which is silly. 
Most of the atheists I've met are good and decent people, at least to the extent that anybody can be. What I'm really questioning is where our values come from. If our morality is just a matter of social convention, if it's just an arbitrary social contract, is that really a moral reason to behave well and consider others? And here's another question for atheists and believers alike. Is the biblical maxim, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them? Well, is that really enough to make your actions moral? Because if you're treating others well just because that's what you would like for yourself, have you really overcome that basic instinct that puts self first? You know, in that same passage, Jesus taught that we're supposed to treat others as we would like to be treated because that's the essence of the Law and the Prophets. When somebody asked Jesus which of the moral commandments was the greatest, Jesus answered by saying this, and you'll find it in Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, the very essence of God's moral law is love and selflessness. And that's because God's moral law is a transcript of who He is. It's a picture of His character. The book of Genesis says that you and I were made, at least originally, in the image of God, as a perfect reflection of His loving character. And then we twisted that terribly, putting our own wants ahead of absolutely everything else. And that's the reason that utopian experiments always fail. It's because we're tragically flawed. And when those experiments fail, we have no problem blaming the people who ruined it while assuring ourselves that we would never ever cause those kinds of problems. I mean, if I was in charge, I could pretty much fix everything, right? Except you and I both know that's not true. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that I really, really want to make the world a better place a thousand years into the future. How exactly am I supposed to guess what's going to be beneficial a thousand years from now? And how am I supposed to guess what culture will look like and what kinds of things people are going to value? I mean, let's suppose that our ancestors did the same thing a thousand years ago. They hatched a plan to improve our lives. Would you really want a medieval doctor planning your health care? Or a medieval anybody planning anything? It's a ridiculous proposition. And yet, because of the perpetual arrogance of every generation, we like to think that we're a lot smarter than the people who came before us. But what if our choices actually end up promoting suffering the way they almost always do? Wouldn't our tinkering then become a moral transgression? Again, I'm not arguing that we shouldn't try. Please don't misunderstand. But I am thinking we should be very careful before we assume that we actually know what we're doing. I mean, how many times have our very best efforts resulted in disaster? How many times haven't we pointed a finger at our ancestors, blaming them for the condition of our world? I'll be right back. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Okay, here's what I find really interesting. It's the fact that there's an entire book of the Bible dedicated to these kinds of questions. Of course, the whole Bible deals with these questions, but there's one book in particular that makes a solid case that all the human planning in the world is never going to end with paradise, and that's the book of Daniel. Here's the basic premise. A young Jewish noble named Daniel is taken captive to Babylon along with everybody else. God allowed the Babylonians to conquer the city of Jerusalem and burn down the temple because his people had abandoned their mission and tried very hard to become like their neighbors, to the point where they actually adopted their religious beliefs. So at the end of the day, there was no point to keeping the temple in Jerusalem because it didn't mean anything anymore. 
what we get in the book of Daniel is an exploration of what it means to live under the thumb of other nations instead of the government of God. In Daniel chapter 2, we see the rise and fall of successive world empires depicted as a statue made of different metals. And as history progresses, the metals become more and more brittle and less and less valuable. Then in chapter 7, we see those same kingdoms portrayed as animals rising from the sea, walking onto the shore. The Jews believed that their nation was a protected island in the midst of Gentile nations, a kind of oasis of covenant grace. But in Daniel 7, the nation of Israel is being dominated by one Gentile nation after the other, and that's why they're seen coming up on the shore. And the thing that drives it all? Nonstop warfare. The book of Daniel shows us an ocean of humanity being whipped up by the wind, and as the turmoil continues, one human kingdom after another fights for power and replaces the one that came before it. It's really a very accurate description of the world's history. And you can be sure, as each new empire took its place on the world stage, it was brimming with promise. I mean, get out of our way, Babylonians. The Persians are here, and they're going to show you how it's done. Until, of course, the Greeks appear on the horizon and take their turn. This progression of failed empires continues until we get to the heavenly judgment when everybody gets called on the carpet. And that results in this scene found in Daniel 7, verse 13. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. You know what it's telling us? You and I are not going to fix this place. It's not going to happen. And again, that doesn't mean we don't have a moral obligation to help people, because we do. In fact, every Christian should take very careful note of Jesus' words over in Matthew chapter 25, where he says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me." So, so yeah, we do have a duty to help our fellow human beings. The very character of God demands that. You can trust your instinct to help people. But when it comes to man-made utopian experiments, well, I think the book of Daniel has proven to be absolutely right. Not one of those experiments so far has done anything to make us happier, because not one of them can fix our fundamental flaw. We're sinners, trapped by a selfish perspective that is never going to change through anything we do. Anybody putting absolute faith in people to fix this world is going to be bitterly disappointed. I mean, we've never pulled it off in the past, and I don't believe for a moment we're going to pull it off in the future. So why trust mere people with the future of the planet? Again, that doesn't mean it doesn't need fixing. It just means that fixing it is going to take something more than what we have to offer. So who do you want to trust with the future? Self-interested people who always seem to use others to accomplish their aims? Or would you rather have a God who sacrificed everything to secure a future for you? Historically speaking, there is only one person who perfectly reflected the image of God. One person who lived a completely selfless life. One person who was willing to lose everything if it meant your utter and complete restoration. And I would like to suggest that before you believe any more promises from well-meaning politicians or social engineers, that you consider the claims of Christ. Because maybe, just maybe, He really does have the ability to give you the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. I'll be right back after this. 
Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. Here's one of the problems with trying to engineer a better future for your grandkids, and that's our skewed understanding of what makes people happy. I mean, just think back to the World's Fairs of the 18 and 1900s, or some of the articles that appeared in popular science journals back in the 1950s. Everybody was optimistic because technology promised more leisure time and less work. But when we actually made life more convenient, we weren't any happier. In fact, I think it's the opposite. Our generation has more comfort, more security, more disposable income than almost any generation that came before it. But we're not happier than our ancestors. We're just a little more comfortable. I mean, just ask yourself, why are we dealing with unusually high levels of depression and anxiety? Why has the political world become more divided, more polarized, and more hostile? Apparently, all the technology in the world hasn't fixed our worst problems. Again, let's think about that experiment that was the former Soviet Union. All those five-year economic plans, all those carefully thought out government initiatives, none of them did anything to help. In fact, apart from a handful of party elites, those decisions made people more miserable. So are we really smart enough to figure out what's going to make the human race happy? Again, God absolutely expects us to alleviate suffering. He expects us to feed the hungry and clothe the poor. He expects us to care for the planet and, yes, leave it better than we found it. But at the same time, I think we should remember a couple of important realities. One, trying to tinker with the future in ways we think is appropriate, that's probably a losing game. Two, speaking from a biblical perspective, we know we're not going to fix it. The Bible indicates quite clearly that you're not going to solve what's wrong with this place. Our existence is a little bit like an old-fashioned Greek tragedy. It doesn't matter how well you plan, if you can't get rid of your fatal flaw, it's going to destroy you. From the Bible's perspective, the problem only gets solved after the judgment when the Son of Man receives His kingdom and He restores this world to what it's supposed to be. And I don't know about you, but if God is real, and I know He is, then I think you'd rather have Him plan the future than somebody like me. Thanks for joining me. I'm Sean Boonstra, and you've been watching Authentic. You want to help more people see Authentic for free? Like, comment, and subscribe, and share this episode. That tells the algorithm you really like the show, which in turn recommends Authentic to a lot more people. Thanks for your support.